Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Literacy View. We have a really special guest on tonight. Uh, we have Nate Joseph. He is the author of two books. Uh, the books are called The Scientific Principles of Teaching and The Scientific Principles of Reading Instruction. He has a podcast. He is a teacher for now 11 years. And he has this very cool blog called Pedagogy Non Grata. And I happen to love that name, Nate. Um, you know, if you know, people know um, persona non grata, right? And that means a person who's not welcomed. So where did you get the name from? It's, it's actually uh, my co-founder named it. Um, we were... We were just in a lot of conversations that we originally just started off as a podcast, uh, much like yours. And uh, we were just um, reading a lot about the science of teaching and reading a lot of research. And we just couldn't help but shake this feeling that um, what was popular in schools and what research was showing was not connected. And we also felt like it felt a little um, unwelcome sometimes to talk about the science that sometimes people preferred to to just go with the trend rather than going with the science. So we felt almost nervous talking about it. And uh, I think this came to the idea of pedagogy non grata, which which mean a uh, means science of teaching not welcome. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I love it. I, I, I absolutely love the name of that. So um, let's begin. All right, so we're going to focus on one of your blogs. And I know that you wrote um, quite a few, and we'll talk okay. about some of them. But our focus tonight will be the Fontes and Pinnell article that you um, wrote and um, the score that you came up with. So why don't we start there? And then Judy will jump in after you just talk about that a bit. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to start off by saying it's really difficult to evaluate um, programs, research programs, because one, um, oftentimes these uh, programs don't have a lot of studies. Um, you know, if you look at something like phonics or structural literacy, well, there's hundreds of studies that are on such a broad topic of that. But if you want to look at a, a specific topic, like say, Fontes Pinnell or Reading Recovery or Wilson, there's going to be far less studies. Um, and then you have to realize that most of the studies that are going to be conducted are going to be done by, by the companies. Um, and then a lot of times, most studies tend to be too low quality to really um, look to to establish um, efficacy. So, you know, how good the program works. Um, I've sort of, uh, I shouldn't say sort of, I have developed a system to try and do this to the best of my ability. I'm not a researcher, I'm a teacher, um, but I've been identifying popular programs and then I, I go through and I uh, identify all the studies I can that have a control group. That's my main um, criteria, it's very broad. I keep it broad on purpose because I don't want to exclude companies because um, a lot of companies don't have the budget to do a really big study. So I don't want to exclude companies as much as possible. Um, and then I, I calculate what's called an effect size um, based off of a, an average of their studies. And then for specific variables like grade or outcomes like fluency, vocabulary, or whatever they've measured, it tends to be different for each one because different studies measure different things and different companies are interested in different outcomes. Um, and, uh, for, for LI, I found, found seven studies that I would say are actually of decently high quality, not amazing. Um, they all use a very similar design, which has a flaw. Um, what they do is they take one group of students who are struggling students and they provide them LLI instruction. So they give them, pull them out of class and they give them extra instruction, um, focusing on guided reading. And then they give the other group no additional instruction. So then we compare how much better did the students do um, in in that time period. Um, and we use an effect size, which is, is really just a standardized percentage. It's supposed to take some of the variability out of it. It's supposed to correct for time and allow us to get a, an understanding of what is the magnitude of effect, so to speak. So like how much did the students improve in the most fair possible way? Now, effect sizes aren't 100% objective. They're not like magic. Um, they're just a, a data tool that we can use to try and get our best estimate of how good something is working, basically. Um, and there were five studies I found that were conducted by one organization. These all showed moderate to high results for the most part. 
And then there were two independent studies um, that both showed very low results. In fact, one showed no significant improvement, and then the other showed a negative improvement. So actually, the group that received zero instruction did better than the group that received LI instruction. Um, and then on average, we saw a mean effect size of 0.31, um, which is considered low. If you if you look in um, uh, a guide to effect sizes, they'll tell you that's low. Now, um, I like to compare things to what we know works because there's to date no peer reviewed meta analysis on balanced literacy. I have conducted a meta analysis on balanced literacy myself, which is up on my blog, um, but it's not peer reviewed. I have submitted it for peer review, so I'm hoping to get it peer reviewed. And it's the, the one I've submitted for peer review is a little bit more dense and it's a little bit more updated. Um, but uh, generally speaking, um, we don't have proof that's been peer reviewed that accepts that balanced literacy works as opposed to, say, structured literacy or phonics. Um, and I, I could dive more into that if you want, but um, if we look at, say, the National Reading Panel, we found a mean effect size of 0.45. Um, if we look at the average across the 15 meta-analyses that have been done that I have found, we see a mean effect size of 0.43. If we look at my meta-analysis, we see an effect size of 0.44 for phonics. And I think you kind of see there's kind of a trend here. It seems that on average, we find this effect of around 0.45 roughly, mm -hmm. um, across the scientific literature. And I mean, depending on how we look at that, we might get a, a slightly lower one if we look at a more specific outcome. But in general, that seems to be the rough estimate of effect for phonics. Um, so balanced literacy getting an effect as a 0.31. It's not nothing. On average, students improved. and um, But they received no instruction. So it's not like we're comparing one group getting Fonus and Penal and another group getting phonics, we're comparing no instruction to Fonus Penal. And um, if we look at that in comparison, say, to the National Reading Panel meta analysis, it's roughly 42% um, um, or sorry, 32% better that the phonics groups are doing in research than the studies on Fontas Penal. And I think a 32% difference is, is sizable, especially mm -hmm. considering that. We're not comparing to say a direct, it's not an equivalent study. It's not a terrible study, but it's not equivalent because you're comparing some instruction in small groups, which we would we would expect to help students almost regardless of what you gave them to, mm -hmm. to no instruction, especially you're thinking over time. Like if you give a group of students, a small group of students extra instruction over a year, you would think that that group of students would improve. So the fact that that average effect was quite small, I think is problematic especially mm -hmm. considering we don't have a peer-reviewed meta-analysis supporting the use of this type of program. Um, and then I have some, some minor concerns about um, some of the studies that were done. I read in one of the, uh, or a couple of the studies, I should say, they were all done by the same organization. And I know what to call them out. I'm not trying to put anyone down. This is a common problem in corporate research. Sometimes in corporate studies, um, researchers will um, not publish results that are not positive. Um, now, usually people don't even admit to doing that. They just don't do it. And there's kind of some signs you can tell if people do that. And, um, but that's really getting into the weeds. But um, in this case, they just openly said this result was not statistically significant, which is problematic because there's a, a huge range of results can be not statistically significant. Um, and by not including those in our average effect, we automatically inflate the mean effect because Anything that was a zero or negative or slightly negative or almost zero is automatically excluded from the results of those studies. So when someone like me comes along and tries to, to calculate the mean, it's automatically going to be higher than what it actually was if they'd included the non-significant results. So, and I think it's important to note that the studies that did not have those kind of claims in there showed much lower results too. Um, so when I say that it's got an effect as a 0.31, I, which is defined by the person who invented its effect sizes as small. And then when we look at the study design, which in my opinion should bias the results to be high, that's problematic. And then when we look at the fact that um, um, there's no real research supporting, in my opinion, um, the efficacy of balanced literacy as a whole, if we look at other programs that are also balanced literacy or similar to balanced literacy, um, I would suggest that this. Um, suggest that this program as a whole is does not have a, a high magnitude of 
um, evidence in its favor. So I, I gave it a, a, a C plus because I wouldn't, I didn't give it like a D because I don't have like, there's some programs out there with studies that show negative effects on average. It's not showing a negative effect. It's not showing um, non-statistically non significant effects on average. It's showing a small but positive effect. But again, when we look at the design of these studies and what is in these studies, it makes sense that it's showing a positive effect because I would imagine if we gave anything to students in this fashion or conducted studies in this fashion, we would likely see positive results. Um, so that's why I gave it uh, the result that I did. So Judy, um, you know, I want to bring you in at this point because your background certainly um, lends itself to, um, you know, bringing others in. We've talked about this, trying to bring people in who have been really um, pro-balanced literacy. Do you think that Nate's study that he has done could sway people in the New York City school system or anywhere for that matter? Just your thoughts on that. So if I'm going to, if I'm going to be completely honest, I think New York City schools, and I'm not speaking for everybody, you know, these are my views. But I think that, you know, we realized that there were problematic pieces for a long time. Um, as you all know, I was trained in balanced literacy. A majority of teachers in New York City, we were doing that for a very, very long time. Now, the problem was that balanced literacy, it wasn't, it wasn't really a program. It was you know, some schools would do foundations and TC. Other schools would do maybe a different thing or uh, Fontes and Pinnell, some phonics. It just wasn't consistent and it wasn't equitable in, in the way it was working in every school. So that could be problematic. So some of the numbers, Nate, those are a lot of numbers. I love data <laughs> when it comes to like a lot of that. Did the kids know the glued sounds? Did they know their letters? Did they know their sounds? When I start seeing like 0 0.3, 0 0.4, that's that's hard for me. But what really stood out for me is your C plus grade. Um, I think it was a three out of 10 for Fontes and Pinnell's literacy program, right? So I, I have two grades to give. I give one grade that is just based on um, the, the research results. Um, so that was the, the C plus. I get yeah, a second think, grade that's yeah. three out of 10. And I base that off of the inclusion of evidence-based practices. So there's 10 practices that in my opinion are the most well-proven and documented within the scientific research for literacy instruction. Yeah. But I feel like we'd ideally want a good program to include. And right. of those, I felt that Fontes Pinnell had three of those to sufficient status. Yeah, I saw that. It warranted um, inclusion. So that three out of 10 basically means they have three of the 10 ingredients that I would say are important. Well, I want to learn more about your ingredients in a couple of moments as well. But basically, when I saw C plus, it made me think of something. When you're walking around New York City, restaurants all have either an A, if they're really clean and they're doing things right, they have a B, a B minus, you're like, oh, maybe I'll go, maybe I won't go. And then a C plus, <laughs> you're like, holy cow, there must be mice in there. It's not <laughs> forget about it. And that was the first thing that came to my mind. Listen, I have right here, right in front of me, I did reading recovery in 2013. A lot of people in New York City, we were trained, we were told by the president of the United States, we got a grant that was called the Obama I-3 grant. And that's what we did. We thought it was what was going to be best. And I'm going to be really honest with you, many things, I have my little pro list, there are good things, but there were some fundamental pieces that were 100% missing. We were not teaching kids how to decode words well. They mm -hmm. were looking at that first letter. And yes, we were, many, many people weren't doing the cueing. They were saying, okay, you said mashed potato. Um, it doesn't look right. It doesn't. It's too much. And also, why were we giving kids complex words in like a level A and B? Like, wait a minute. I even wrote down some of the words that I used to see. Like, um, where are some of my words? Hold on one second. There's so. Well, even you know what? A word like um tomato. Why? Oh, because you saw a little picture of a tomato and you see a little T. Ha ha. Yes, the point of level A books, nobody wanted to stay on them too long. They were mostly to teach one-to-one -one correspondence. However, for many kids, it habituated very bad patterns. 
They mm -hmm. were being trained to look at the picture as their first course of action and to see that letter T and cross check back and forth. But that really, really hurt a lot of kids because as the books got more complex, kids developed very bad habits. They didn't know how to decode well. Many teachers, unfortunately, some did, some didn't, didn't know how to teach it well. And basically that means we failed a lot of kids. So yes, there were many good things. I hope I could get to the good list today because you know, for a couple of weeks I've been saying, oh my God, there were good things. There were things that were aligned with the science, but there were genuine flaws and I'm ready to accept it. And you know what? I think people have to really like stop this back and forth. No, this is better. This is better. This is better. This is better. Like cut it out. Yeah. It's better if kids can decode words well and not guess. So because yes. even if we were teaching them, wait, one more thing, even more, even if we weren't teaching kids to guess, because like some people will say, yes, we weren't teaching cueing. However, many kids, even if you weren't teaching them to guess, they guessed because they didn't have the skills to tackle the words that they were seeing. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to bring this back to um, Fontes and Pinnell. So the reading recovery, as you said in your article, Nate, um, you know, Fontes and Pinnell based a lot of their instructional practices off of reading recovery. Yeah. So I, you know, I just want to make sure that what, you know, Judy is saying is relevant to the Fontes and Pinnell right. um, programs. Think, yeah, I think the reading recovery part is extremely pertinent to it because like I said earlier, we don't have, we don't have a peer reviewed meta-analysis of this philosophy of instruction. And part of that is because it's very loosely defined and there's not really a strong, it doesn't seem to me there's a strong consensus over what is balanced literacy. But we have a couple of programs that that there does seem to be consensus that these constitute as balanced literacy. You know, um, um, units of study, reading recovery, and Fontes Pinnell. And they're they're obviously all inspired by each other because reading recovery inspired Fontes Pinnell and units of study was inspired by um, Fontes Pinnell. So, um, and when we look at research, it's... I think there's there's you, we can look at this ultra specific research of just um, Fontes Pinal, but there's also a ton of studies on reading recovery, and we see pretty similar results with reading recovery to right. um, um, Fontes Pinal. They also they have a sort of really unusual study design they use in almost all of the reading recovery studies. But something I have noticed that um, actually was noticed by um, um, oh I'm forgetting the person she has shares the almost the identical last name with me, although we're not related, Hanford. Emily Hanford, is that right? <laughs> yes. her, her podcast. Yes. She's on oh. social media every day we see her name. Yeah, sorry, I'm just oh, resetting wow. my card. See? Oh, and wow. uh, so she um, she pointed out that there was a very large scale study um, that um, showed negative results once it was on the long run. Like the longitudinal results, uh, results, uh, results were, were negative. And um, I've noticed that there's actually multiple studies in reading recovery that seem to show this. And when I looked at these Fontes Pinnell results, I wasn't looking at the longitudinal. I was only looking at um, short-term studies where we saw this, you know, sort of small effect or positive effect. If you look at the reading recovery studies, there's there's a lot of uh, reading recovery studies that are very short that show a strong effect. And I'm going to turn off my camera, guys, because I seem to be glitching like crazy on my camera. Yeah, we didn't say anything. I could see it in Faith's eyeballs. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I apologize to anyone who watches this, um, but there was there was um, really strong effects on the short term for reading recovery. But when we look at the long term on multiple longitudinal studies, we see negative effect sizes where students actually did worse in the treatment group than they did in the group of students who received no instruction. And I, I, I don't it's hard to isolate individual factors because we're not looking at one part of reading recovery at a time. But my guess my hypothesis would be the same as, as um, Hanford, that it's um, the guessing, that it's the three queuing. And maybe you're right that maybe not everyone teaches the three queuing. Right. Um, you're, you Maybe it's that students are yeah. sort of learning how to guess at words. And then that this works in the, the early years where the, the texts are very simple. But when they get to the later years, when they yeah, learn how to rely on this, the texts are too complex. So there's no pictures anymore suddenly these tactics don't work and it's it's actually a debt to their detriment that they learn this. Nate, can I interrupt for a second? Can I ask you a question? Yeah, definitely. All right. So 
listen, reading recovery is part of my older story, right? Now I'm mm. like, a, I love foundations. I'm praying to Norton Gillingham. However, like when I was doing reading recovery, we, we had some pets and things that we did that weren't designed by, I don't think they were designed by reading recovery. Uh, we used to have to administer something called the Ohio, the Ohio word test. We also did an assessment called the Slotson test, which was uh, testing decoding skills. There was also an Iowa test. And also then I remember that we used to have to put in our data in a system called IDEC. And I don't know how all the pieces work, but there were control groups and so forth. So that's how, you know, I felt, oh, okay, this is, you know, their studies. We hated putting in the data, but we did do all of that. And then we were always told there was something, and I don't know a lot about this, um, we were always told, look at the What Works Clearinghouse. So, you know, for you know, me, I'm actually glad you mentioned that. I'm happy because... I mentioned it too, because I this was, a, you know, this was a long time ago, but I remember thinking, okay, something's not right. My kids aren't learning to decode that well, but this is saying it's great, which was What's Work Clearinghouse. And, you know, some of the pieces may have like the alphabet assessment and all of that might have been developed by reading recovery, but not the Slotson test and the Ohio word test. So basically, like, how does a classroom teacher figure out, okay, what I'm doing is right, what I'm doing is evidence based, because I'm sure like, moving forward, some people might just put a sticker on their program, say it's an SOR program, but how does an average person like me, figure it out? Yeah, and I, 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 I have mixed feelings about this, because and I'll, I might touch on my blog a little on this, but I've actually been quite critical of what works clearinghouse um, because what works clearinghouse and I use a very opposite model. In fact, yeah. I actually offered a paper recently that I've submitted for peer review with um, Dr. Schechter on this very topic, criticizing the what works clearinghouse model. Um, I wrote a blog on it too. Yeah. And I did. We, we this wrote, is we, really interesting for me, guys, because this is what we were told is yeah. like, oh my God, this is saying we're awesome. But now I'm hearing, and I know I've spoken to Faith many times, that it's not so awesome. So I need to know why. So, and, and I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. And, you know, basically there's a couple different ideas of thought on how do we determine if something works. Right. You know, the, the one that the National Reading Panel put forward, if they took a large number of studies of, I would say, medium quality or high quality, medium to high quality, and they said, what was the average effect? Which is what I did originally, and I've, I've sort of mod evolved my process a little over time. Um, and uh, what works clearinghouse did something very different. They basically said that education has a, a problem with low quality research. So what they did is they only took the absolute highest quality studies and then they um, ignored all the rest of the research. So for example, reading recovery has, uh, depending on how you define it, they, I don't know, it's, it's really hard to add how we define it, around a hundred studies let's say okay. there's a, around 100 studies now most of those i will also exclude for being too low quality but i've I identified i think off the top of my head i think it's 22 studies i'm forgetting exactly now it's been a while since i looked at reading recovery but i i i identified about 20 that were of that medium quality to high quality um and there's ways we can control for quality but the, what works clearinghouse did is said we're only looking at these highest quality studies and then we're only going to look to see if they have a positive effect that's statistically significant in anything so um, if they find like one effect that's statistically significant and it's positive and it's a really high quality study, they give it the check, like the biggest check mark possible. They say it's tier one evidence. Great. Um, and one of the problems, there's a couple of problems with this. One, um, study companies and um, researchers too tend to not publish results that are positive. In fact, they often just don't um, publish their paper if they don't get the results they want. Or if they get a negative result, they often don't publish it. And sometimes even worse, they'll publish some of the results of their study, but not all of the results. So let's say we do a test for fluency, vocabulary, comprehension, decoding, and one of those is negative. We just exclude that from the paper, um, which is really bad. Um, I, so you know, I think that's very interesting because I feel that these data warehouses, the you know, no. um, the evidence for ESSA, no. the What Works Clearinghouse. It's very misleading. And is, yeah. as Judy said, for the average teacher and for the average administrator, looking yeah. at what works and evidence for ESSA, they don't have the time to sort through all the details. They basically look at 
the C plus or the A or the top grade or the bottom grade. And they're like, okay, I feel justified in my choices. I know neighboring districts have chosen these types of programs. So I, I feel confident that I'm doing the right thing. And, you know, I wrote blogs about this, a, a couple. Mm-hmm. And uh, this was when, um, you know, I was hearing things about reading recovery, um, making a comeback. And I wrote a blog called Reading Recovery Hops On, um, you know, with the whole uh, queuing strategies, a play on the queuing strategies. But Nate, you, you've, you've been in teaching now 11 years. What made you decide to start delving into this? Was it because you didn't feel comfortable with what you were doing in teaching or because you just felt the way things were chosen were not um, accurate? Yeah, well, I was working when I first got into this, I was I was working at an indigenous school um, uh, in the far north of Canada and uh, like really far north. And um, my my students were struggling and I felt like there were academic practices that weren't working. And I went and I go, took some courses and I, I got my specialist in special education and reading instruction. And I noticed that a lot of the things that my professors were saying, they just didn't seem validated by science. And at the same time, I was really into fitness. So I was really into weightlifting and I was following these influencers or researchers who were really interested in promoting a science perspective to research. And they were they were really phenomenal at explaining how they did their research and showed the research results. And in fact, I've modeled all of my result, my style of teach or um, writing off of these these people. Um, and um, so I when I took these courses, like there were so many claims. Like one of the ones, there's two that really bothered me more than any else. One was that we had to teach the students learning styles. That was so crucial. Right. And another was that um, we cannot teach students to read too early that it will damage their their cognitive abilities. Like I actually had that written in my textbook that reading instruction done too early damages the brain. And I was like, okay, that just doesn't sound right. Like that sounds, for lack of a better word, it sounds dumb. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like, look, there's no citation in my textbook. Um, So I I went and tried to find research on it. Um, And at the same time, I was also taking RTI training and we got exposed to John Hattie's work, visible um, learning. And I started learning about meta-analysis and I started reading through the meta-analyses and I was like, why don't you explain connect. that to people? Um, yeah. I mean, I know what a, a meta-analysis sure. is, but I think it's important that people listening understand what you do because you are not doing the research. What you are doing is looking at the research, um, yeah. these all these independent studies on the one subject. So just yeah. maybe explain that. Yeah, so... Uh, a meta-analysis is a study of studies. Yeah. So you take all of the studies on a topic and you try to find the average outcome and you try to cu- find out the average outcome for individual variables. Um, just like I talked about with Fonis Pinal. Um, you know, for example, and I think it's really important in education because we have a very high variety of study results often. And, uh, you know, just to, not to pick on reading recovery, but for example, there's a reading recovery study out there. I think it's Iverson 1999 showed an effect size of 2.49, which roughly roughly translates to 249% improvement, which is massive, huge. Okay. And then we have other studies on reading recovery that showed negative results, where the students in the treatment group did worse than the control group. So I think it's a really bad idea to try and pick one of those individual studies to say, this is the most representative of right. reading recovery or a program, and which is essentially what, what Works Clearinghouse does. I really don't like that method. I'd rather say, like, let's read all of the studies and we can screen out the lowest quality ones. I'm not saying, and there's also things we can do. I won't get too into it to control for quality. We can wait for quality. We can use multi-level modeling, but um, we can get a rough idea of what on average is the results. And I think this is a far better um, lens. You know, just looking at eggs, for example, I love to look at eggs because everybody's heard on the news, a new study came out showing eggs are bad for you, or a new study came out saying eggs are good for you. And it's confusing. And you hear people saying, why don't the scientists just make up their mind? Right. I do that all the time. (laughs) Yeah. Science doesn't work that way. Science doesn't look at one study or it shouldn't, in my opinion. It's like, what do most of these studies show? What is the scientific consensus? So meta-analysis is a tool to try and determine what is the most normalized result of this intervention. Interesting. Um, Well, 
here's my thought. You had said in your article that um, Fontes and Pinnell's program is the most widely used English language program in the world. Yeah. That was interesting. Right. Is it really in the whole world? I, believe, I thought I'd read that previously. Now, okay. I didn't cite that, to be fair. So maybe I should have done, uh, cited that and checked it. But I, I'm fairly certain that it is. Okay. Well, it's large. Let's put it yeah. that way. It's it's yeah. widespread. How about that? Probably in English-speaking countries, right? Yeah. But, yes. Like, yes. Yeah. And um, so it's widespread, Nate. So, you know, what gets me is it's all over the place. And you come up with this meta-analysis showing that it's not very effective overall. And yeah. yet districts all over the place have adopted this. Generally, it's it's basically in every school to some yeah. degree. Yeah. Um, well, could you please speak to that a little bit in terms of this widespread use? And I'll tell you why I'm bringing this up. Judy and I spoke to Tim Rosinski, Dr. Tim Rosinski, a couple, of, a couple of weeks ago. I listened to that. You listened to it. Great. So then you know what I'm talking about. And, you know, we were talking about fluency and we were talking about um, when to introduce fluency and what to use. I don't want to get too much into that discussion now, but when we started to talk about Lucy Calkins and units of study, he said that basically how bad could it be? And I'm, I'm paraphrasing, of course, he didn't say it exactly like this. How bad could it be? Because it's all over the place. So are you telling me that all these people bought something and it's not very good? It must have something redeeming if all these schools bought into this. Yeah. I had my own feelings about that. If you listen, then you heard. But and I have my own feelings I, too. I and I want to hear what you have to say, Nate. One more thing before Nate speaks. You know how I feel. I think the problem was not just Lucy. I think there were very big problems in schools that had nothing, no curriculums as well. Yeah. So it's not just a Lucy problem. Yes, maybe. And one, one last thing. I think a distinction has to be made. Reading recovery is not the same thing as Fontes and Pinnell and not TC. They basically copied reading recovery and made it for a whole group of students. From my interpretation, when reading recovery was developed, it was developed for a class of, for a student that possibly had a strong phonics program and still wasn't getting it, or that's what we were led to believe, yeah. or I was. But you know, they're not all identical, and it's a very, very different thing when you're working with one kid yeah. as opposed to a whole class. I'm telling you though, from the bottom of my heart, everybody listening, those sneak peeks, those picture walks, the the non-expertise of looking through the whole entire word, putting complex words in a uh, level A, love versus like in an F and P book. Come on, really? Why is the kid supposed to lose points? Because the kid said, you know, it's just ridiculous. Climb, uh, the word climb, and just these complex multisyllabic words in it was just messed up, but I do think that they're not all the same program, but I also think the problem was way bigger than just Lucy, because I've seen schools that had nothing. But, but Judy, it what I'm saying is yeah. it's widespread, mm -hmm. and so it's all yeah. over the place, yeah. and my question to Nate is, what do you think about that? I mean, Dr. Tim Rosinski said there must be you know, a lot good in all of this if everybody's buying into that. I want to know your feelings about yeah, it. I have a lot of thoughts on this. Um, first off, I don't I don't love to like um, talk about an individual person behind balanced literacy because I, I, I generally think, Lucy Calkins included, that people have the best interests of children at heart and that they did what they thought was best. And, you know, we just didn't have a ton of research on this idea. And I feel like what we have wrong is not, a person problem, what we have wrong is a philosophy problem in that um, we we really just approached education like an art and not a science. And we yeah. really, when we asked about what was science, we we didn't ask hard enough questions because it really, the, some of the people who be, who rose up through the ranks as, as researchers too, were not necessarily the most um, high qualified researchers or the best researchers. They were the people who are the best at marketing. And I'm sure they believed in their messages. I'm sure they're, but they're charismatic. And that is why they succeeded, not because the science was good. Mm -hmm. And um, 
you know, people, they, they look for leaders to tell them, like, what is the answer? And uh, I really, this is something I tried to do on my blog. I don't try to just give an answer. I try to explain my process, my thinking, and then why I think the answer is and how I got there, rather than just saying, this is what we should do. Um, because, you know, I don't, I'm not going to say I'm an expert. I'm not. Um, I'm a teacher. And I, I just like to read through the science and try to make sense of it. Um, and I, I think we could use with a little more critical thinking and we could use with a little more of that inside the training systems too. I know when I was at university um, learning how to become a teacher, we never looked at a meta-analysis. We never had any training on how to read a study. That's we were right. never um, taught what is the science behind something. Right. We, we were always just told, um, one, what are your feelings on this? What are your thoughts and opinions on this? Without having any training or understanding of what we're reading or looking at science, and we spent tons of time writing lesson plans. Um, right. But I don't know that how much value any of that training had. Um, and I, I think we need to, to rethink teacher training to be a little more critical and a little more science focused. And I get it. Teaching is both an art and a science. Everybody, I think, can accept that. Um, but we've been so focused on this art side that I think part of the problem, too, is that a lot of people who are in the teaching training programs, they're not scientists. They're not researchers. They're not people who understand science. So they don't not only do they not understand how to read it, they don't even see, necessarily see the value in it. Um, I would agree with that. I, I would definitely agree that um, there, there are teachers who not only don't understand it, but they, they really feel that we've gone overboard. I mean, the, you see the comments online about, oh, you SOR people. And it's kind of funny to me, you know, just how we label that as, oh, you SOR. What, what does that even mean? You science of reading people, you terrible people that you believe in evidence. <laughs> it's just yeah. such a silly comment to me. Um, moving off of that, um, what was stunning to me in your article was that you said that there were no studies that you found on the Fontes and Pinnell core instruction. What, what you did was you based um, your meta-analysis on LLI, which is the intervention program. Is that yeah, correct? Sure. That's correct, yeah. So how um, do you think that there are no studies on the largest, you know, the, the largest, um, I don't know what you call it, a program? It's, it's Fontes and Pinnell core instruction, a program? You know, and I, I, See, that's I why there are no studies. It did, that it did come packaged as a program. I actually saw it. It's a book, and it had um, a lesson on reading behaviors. This is what you're but, doing but today. But that's not it's really a program. program. Yeah, it looked like a program, though. It was marketed like a program. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, uh, I, and I always like to make the caveat to the best of my knowledge because you know, there's so many journals out there, and the internet's such a wide place, right. and there's so many theses that get done. You know. First step I always do is look at the company website because most companies will list their their studies. And in fact, Fonda Spinell listed all the positive studies. They didn't <laughs> yeah. list the negative studies, which is exactly. not very honest in my opinion. Um, but Me then too. I did a, a search on academic databases afterwards for additional studies. And I found those two negative studies that were independent. Um, but yeah, to the best of my knowledge, there are no studies, at least with control groups. Now, I always exclude studies that don't have control groups in them, or at least I do that if they have a study with a control group. Um, if they don't have any studies at all without control groups, then I'll, then I'll take some lower quality studies and just do a really poor analysis, for lack of a better word. Um, but um, yeah, I think it is funny that there are there's not a lot of research because maybe there is a study somewhere that I couldn't find. But if there is, there's just not a lot of research on the core instruction part. It's all focused on the, the intervention side. Now, I will admit, in general, we do seem to find more research for intervention on helping our struggling readers than mm -hmm. we do for instruction. But there are lots of core instruction studies out there. So I, I do find it strange too that that wasn't there. And it's always possible too. Maybe this sounds a bit conspiratorial. I'm not accusing anyone of this, but it's always possible that they did a core instruction study that didn't show positive benefits and they didn't publish it. That might be right. part of that. Right, right. So Judy, I'm, a, I'm going to ask you a question that kind of sure. goes back to what Nate has been discussing. Yes. So, um, you know, the way I see this, I, I find it all suspicious. I'm going to use your word, Nate. It's, there's something suspicious. We can't accuse people of, you know, purposely hiding information, right. 
but it's certainly suspicious when you see that um, if it's, um, you know, one place that's doing all these studies and they come up very high mm -hmm. and they happen to be all even, I think you have here, the results were all identical standard deviations. Oh, that was for a, a specific study. So I can, I can speak to that a little bit, but they, so, and it was very clear what they did. They, they had an outlier data point. I think the effect size Wait, I found. Who was also. that? I, I, I lost that. Sorry. So, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll try to explain. So one of the studies, the, the, all these studies have a large number of results, right? Mm -hmm. So, but for one of the studies, they had a result and I forget the exact demographics. It was reported for multiple demographics, but it was clearly the same result over and over again, because any, I mean, think of it this way. If you have, say, just as an example, if you have Latino students who are impoverished getting um, subsidized lunch, yeah. instead of doing that all as one report, they break that down into each demographic and repeat it as three separate outcomes. So there's our Latino outcome, and then there's our, our impoverished outcome, and then there's our, our, our ESL outcome. And I'm just making up those because I forget what it was. It was a while ago that I did that. Um, mm -hmm. but, um, it was so clearly that they had just replicated that over and over again, because not only was the mean, and this wasn't effects, this was their raw data that I turned to an effect size, but the number of students was identical. The mean result for the treatment group and the control group was identical and the standard standard deviation was identical. Mm -hmm. And then it resulted in this super outlier effect size of like three something, which right. normally I would exclude anyways from any study because it's obviously an outlier. Right. Um, and uh, but they put it in there three times, which if you took if you didn't out take that out as an outlier, um, you would end up with this massive effect size for this one study. And I was like, ah, that seems dicey. Um, yeah. But I'm going to be I, I don't love focusing on just the quality of studies, because one, I don't want to feel like I'm attacking a researcher. I think most researchers are trying for the best of heart. Everybody has bias. Everybody does. Mm -hmm. um, but there's there's problems of quality on, on research on all sides. You know, right. there are, there's definitely some phonics studies out there that are not well done. Mm -hmm. There's definitely some balanced literacy studies that are not well done. And I, rather than some people, I think want to find this, this unicorn study, which mm -hmm. I don't, I don't think is great because they're just, they don't exist there. Every study has a, a design flaw. Right. Um, as an example, I'm working on a comprehension meta-analysis right now. We have, uh, I think, I think 86 studies included. And wow. if we look at the highest quality ranking for metrics, we only have uh, six studies. Um, so I'm not going to exclude um, 82 studies mm -hmm. and only look at those six, um, because what do we learn from looking at six studies on mm -hmm. comprehension? Because comprehension is such a complicated topic. How do you learn right. something if you exclude right. that much data? So I, I wanted to bring this back to Judy. So in oh, God, God, I'm a little nervous. No, no, don't be nervous. Get a drink of water first. <laughs> so, oh, so um, you know, in, in reading this, I actually was thinking of you, Judy, because if you saw this while you were still teaching reading recovery, what would you think if you saw, let's say this was a study, we were talking about reading recovery right now, and you right. were a reading recovery teacher, and you read this over, how would you react to that? With this, I guess what I'm asking you is if you were still practicing these types of strategies, how would you take it if you read um, Nate's study? Would you be open to listening to this? Or would you say, who is this Nate guy and what does he know? Because I love reading recovery and I know it works or I see the benefits. In other words, would you be poking holes in his study? I guess that's what I'm asking. So that's a really interesting question. So basically, I don't see myself as a person that trusts things very easily. I always have questions in my mind. And those questions were in my mind way before I saw Nate's studies. I saw it with the, own ki the kids that I was sitting at a table with. And I saw that after 20 weeks, they didn't make as much progress as I wanted them to make. And I was like, wait, something's not right. And then I was like, hmm, dyslexia, does that exist? And nobody wanted to talk about it. It was like, you had to keep your mouth shut. And then I would call my friend, you know, do we recognize dyslexia? Could this be dyslexia? And there just wasn't that open conversation. It was kind of like, 
hmm, dyslexia maybe is not real. And my gut told me something's not right. So yes, Nate's study wasn't there, but I knew something wasn't right. But it's also very hard when you're being told at a federal level, this is what you should do. And this is what's best for kids. Yeah. And you give your heart and soul. And then, you know, it works for some kids. I know some of the kids that I worked with many years ago, they are successful. They got into private schools on full scholarships. So of course there were pockets of success. There was great things. There was the Elkonin boxes, which were science aligned. There were spelling boxes, which were science aligned. But there were also things that were clearly not aligned with the science. We didn't show kids decodable text. Why? At the lower but, levels, that's that's a critical piece. And you know what? I'm mad at myself. Why didn't I fall in love with decodables much sooner in my career? I'm 47 years old and I only fell in love with decodables when I was 40. Why? How many kids lost out? How many kids, you know, are are even now being told, don't sound out the words, look at the picture, even in one wealthy towns where uh, kids are doing foundations for a half hour and then being told everything I just learned, screw it, don't do it. And you know what? Kids are getting confused. So, you know, Nate's study is great, but at the end of the day, you know, teachers are just trying to get through the day. We don't have that much time to read studies. We're trusting that, you know, high right. up above. But I, I guess what I was saying yeah. was if you, at this point in time, I would if say you help. were to yeah. read this, would you be somebody, or let's say other teachers you worked with, would they be attacking Nate? And I guess I would throw this I question so out to you, Nate. Do you get attacked often when people don't <laughs> like what you have to say? You know what? It's really, I was just thinking about this night. I, when, um, I've been writing about this for four years and, uh, I just really learned how to use social media this year. So, uh, the year I learned how to use social media, obviously my, my traffic went up quite a bit. In fact, um, I, it went up like more than sixfold this year after learning how to use social media, um, which really just makes me the dinosaur in the room, I guess. Um, but, uh, uh Nate, I believe me, I only started using it five or six years ago, and I consider myself a tech knot. Honestly, <laughs> just, some people are tech no, I am a tech knot. So, we're getting um, better I, every day, Faith. We're getting better. We're getting better. Right. We're getting better every day. But getting back to what yeah. we were saying, so people attack you, Nate? Uh, when I first started getting active on social media, I got a ton of attacks, and I got lots of hate mail. Uh, I got lots of really mean, for lack of a better word, mean mean emails sent to me about what a bad person I was. Um, and, and you know what, though, it's, I get why, you know, um, I am not a researcher, I'm a teacher. Um, and I do have a small group of people who help me. And, you know, going back to, to What Works Clearinghouse, you know, that's an entire organization from sponsored by the United States government doing this. And I'm here I am criticizing them. But um, wait, that's a government program? Slow down. Uh, what, works clearing, what Works Clearinghouse, I believe. Yeah, I believe it's government funded. Um, but, uh, I would love to get a, a, a much larger group of people. And I'm kind of saying this in part on your podcast in case anyone listens and wants to help out, but I don't make money off that. Like the blog is not monetized. There's no advertising on it. Yes. I have my book, which is for sale on my blog, but, mm -hmm. um, like it's, it costs me, I, I spent more money on, um, uh, on the blog this year than I made from book sales. Mm -hmm. Uh, so um, I would much rather a group of dedicated researchers do what I'm trying to do. And, and I've actually reached out to specific or researchers to ask if they'd be willing to help me on this project, because I really strongly believe that we need research that is teacher friendly, that is in language that teachers understand, mm -hmm, that is yeah. neutral, yes. that is, and that is looking at um, pedagogy or like programs and pedagogy from this lens of like, not just what is the highest quality studies show, but what, what what can we be confident based on both the results, the quality, and the number of studies done? I think we got to look at all three of those factors. And I would love if if there's any researchers listening to this who would like to, to volunteer their time. And there are a couple, actually, who do volunteer their time. But, you know, I do a lot of the work on my own. And uh, it's nerve wracking. You know, I don't want to be that sole source. You know, mm -hmm. I'd much rather be like, hey, I'm a guy shooting out his ideas on the Internet. This is what I found. This is what I think. 
interact with me, tell me if you find something. And sometimes people do find something I've made a mistake on and I, I do my very best to change it. I'm also a bit paranoid about that. So I'm constantly rechecking effect sizes and rechecking results and like going back and editing articles as I find something to fix. Um, but yeah, you know what though? I got a ton of hate at the beginning, but uh, lately it's been like a solid month since I got any hate mail. And I'm sitting here just well, very pleased that nobody's sending me the hate mail anymore. And maybe it's just because I, I, I don't know, maybe people know who I am now and they're, they're, they're less anxious about why, why is this guy posting about education research so much? I don't work for any company. Uh, uh, like I thought, I think sometimes people think you secretly work for like one of the big phonics companies, <laughs> or one of the big, like, it's funny. I've been accused of both working for big phonics and working for big balance literacy because I will criticize phonics programs when I see low research results, which, but I also criticize balanced literacy programs. Which is the next point that I want to bring up. So to be fair, I looked at your other articles on your, um, you know, your website, yeah. and there were quite a few that are evidence-based that did not get high grades. And, um, or people think there's a lot of evidence behind it. How about that? And did not get high grades. So I know like there's a big wave now for wit and wisdom. Okay. Yeah. I'm just going to, you know, throw that name out. Um, HMH also. Well, you know what? On Nate's website, one of your blogs did not give wit and wisdom such a great high grade. Would you like to speak about that? Sure. Um, I've actually recently updated my review for Wit and Wisdom, partly really? based off criticism I've gotten for that one. Um, <laughs> but uh, part of my my criticism was one, like there was no phonics specifically built into the prog program. And I want to see, I, I believe that uh, language programs for younger kids should include phonics. But now I, I understand we, that they include- Can I just jump in for a second? I I know that a lot of schools use wit and wisdom in conjunction with foundations. Though. Right, right. And I did I did put that in there, but they they recommend yeah. that. But I uh I didn't want to review it based off its inclusion of foundations. I wanted to review it based off its inclusion of just itself, because I think some schools are likely to buy just wit and wisdom without another phonics program to go with it. And mm -hmm. if you buy wit and wisdom as part of your fluency and comprehension instruction to go with your phonics program. I think that's a great idea, but on its own, I don't, I don't love the idea. And the, the second part I will say is that um, to the best of my knowledge, there are no studies with control groups on wit and wisdom, which is a big part of my, my criteria. So there was no research per se for me to, to review. A lot of that research was just um, broad research. So like ideas behind their program that there are their studies to support. But to the best of my knowledge, there are no high quality studies on wit and wisdom itself. So that, so that was why I gave it more of a negative review than some of the other ones. Wow. So um, buyer beware. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, but, and you also, I think you reviewed Wilson as well. Yeah. So I'm Wilson certified. Wow, you're doing some name dropping tonight, Faith. Well, I think because we are talking about Fontes and Pinnell, I don't want to be attacked and people say, Oh, you focused on FMP, but if you look at Nate's website, he also did not give such high scores to this, this, and this. So I want to be fair and say, look, I'm Wilson certified. I'm, you know, but I don't think Wilson is the end all. I think there are gaps in Wilson. And um, what was the score? If you do you recall what was the score for Wilson? It wasn't I believe it wasn't as it was it was higher than um um uh Faunus Pinelli. It was, I believe, a B if off the top of my head is what I gave. I actually it. thought it was um lower than a B. If I, I actually I'm gonna be honest, I updated Wilson very recently. And I okay. also as of today, I actually up up uh I changed my grading system slightly. Wow, okay. <laughs> so a lot of a lot, and that was a reflection of the fact when I first made the grading system, I had spent more time researching individual ideas or pedagogies like phonics or um vocabulary or comprehension i hadn't spent as much time on programs and i hadn't realized how little research there was on programs so i had very grandiose ideas and expectations i wanted to see the same level of research on programs as exists for principles and mm -hmm. there, just, there isn't so actually i i put out a, a post about that today and i updated the grading system to reflect that so most programs went up slightly actually as i increased the grading system 
um, mm -hmm. reading or sorry, uh, Fontes Pinel did not, um, mm -hmm. but Wilson probably did. Um, now, my my point to Wilson is just is pretty pretty simple. Is if we look at the studies on Wilson on average, and this has been pointed out by many researchers, not just you know myself. And I don't really consider myself a researcher. I'm a teacher who does this for okay. a hobby. But um, the many of the studies on Wilson, and there's there's to best of my knowledge four show on average a lower result than when we compare it to other phonics programs. Now, so are we saying Wilson as the intervention, or are we saying foundation? So, oh, no, Wilson I, is the intervention, correct? Yeah, so that's so very. Different I found than three studies on Wilson the intervention for for Wilson word reading, and I found one study on foundations. Um, but uh, the results across the four studies were pretty, pretty. There was one higher effect study, uh, and then there was three low studies. And the one higher effect study was the lowest quality one. Um, but I do have some caveats I want to make about that. Firstly, um, the principles behind um, Wilson and foundations are evidence based. So unlike, you know, Fox Pinellas I pointed out earlier, um, there's no peer reviewed meta analysis of balanced literacy programs, to the best of my knowledge, showing high effects. So we don't have any strong evidence that balanced literacy as an idea works. And we also know that Fonts Pinal is lacking in instruction, or at least in my opinion, on certain elements, which is why I gave it that three out of 10 for qualitative. Mm -hmm. I believe my, my qualitative grade for, for Wilson is nine out of 10. So it has nine of the 10 things that I think are necessary for good instruction. Wow. So qualitatively, I think it's a good program. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, I have a hard time guessing as to why it, it shows lower results in research. I have a couple of theories, but they're just theories, they're guesses. Mm -hmm. um, and another thing I think I want really want to point out about the Wilson studies is that the lowest results are for fluency by far. Mm -hmm. And that really dragged down the average result because when you see that mean effect size, it's an average of all the outcomes together. And the fluency outcomes for, for Wilson, for whatever reason, it could be a fluke in the data. That was happening. Oh, I don't think it is. You don't think it is? Okay, I'd love to hear because I'm not a Wilson person. I've never used yeah. Wilson. Yeah. Um, I'm well, just looking at the research. I, so I think that kids are tapping way too long. Well, and they they're should not, be tapping when they're reading. They should. But I'm telling, telling you well. that they come to me yeah. and you could see that that every time they're reading another word, they're stopping and they're thinking of every sound. And I think that's probably the implementation of the program and that they're staying with some of these types of um, strategies a little bit too long and not enough instruction on how to blend sounds. But, you know, I, I didn't want to really get into each program, I wanted to point out, because I normally don't, as Judy knows, I don't usually get into the names of programs so deeply, yeah. but I wanted to point out, Nate, that you do um, give lower scores to phonics programs as well as balanced literacy programs. And that I think is fair in terms of looking at these programs. It's not just like you're giving all terrible scores because it's considered balanced literacy. There are programs that people would consider um, well-researched evidence-based that you're saying, well, you know what? It's not um, It's not an A, put it that way. Hey, can yeah. I ask you something? How the hell do we sort out this mess? Like the I know. The kids are counting on us. What do we do? You know, who do, you know, why isn't the whole country outraged at what's going on? Where is Jill Biden and everybody else? Like, what is <laughs> going Jill on? Biden. Like, how do we figure figure out like what to do next? I mean, you know, we hear so many things aren't working. We know some things are working, but like even like guided reading, right? Right. The science of reading says it has to look differently. What does that mean? Do we follow like I have an Orrin Gillingham template? Like, what does the next step look like? And I think because so many people are going back and forth trying to figure out what's working and what's not working, the kids are losing out because that's time that they lose that we're giving them the quality instruction that they are entitled to. And listen, at the end of the day, research has come out. We can't ignore it. We can't say that it doesn't exist. Even like for foundations, and I know we're not supposed to name programs, they used to call it trick words, but now the research is saying not everything in a trick word is tricky. Let's capitalize on the known parts. Like in a word like should, 
The SH, if you learn that diagram, it's not tricky anymore. The OU is tricky, so you might put a heart over it. The L is tricky, but the D is phonetic. So like, how do we- But honestly, Judy, other programs wouldn't consider that tricky at all because, you know, if, if you learn that basically all these um, letters could be code for the sound, so O-U-L could just be the sound uh. And right, that's right. that's taught is just right. another right. way of showing the uh sound. Right. But, but again, not be, right? Yeah, yeah. Let's. You know what I'm saying. I know what she's saying. She basically, is, how do we how right. do we sort through the mess? Right. It's a it's a it's a mess because it's not only about that 30 minutes phonics block. It's really about you know literacy instruction in some schools is 120 minutes. How do we maximize what we we're doing? Do we do shared reading? Do we do only connected text? Are we using decodables? What does my library look like? It's like, how do we tell the average teacher that's just trying to get through the day and hopefully come home and feed their family and maybe watch a little bit of Netflix? <laughs> you know, like how yeah. do they, or, or yeah. like I watch. But Bachelor take care of a one-year-old baby. <laughs> right, or watch Bachelor in Paradise and, and nonsense TV. Right. So it's, it's really hard. and. You know, at the end of the day, is it really a teacher's responsibility to like say, hey, Mr. Principal, like this program's not research-based. It, it, you know, we can't put all the responsibility on teachers. Yes, as teachers, we should be asking questions now. Yes, we know a lot of people are over-attached to leveled literacy. Like even a lot of administrators, they can't let go of that. Why? Because many of them don't know the science of reading. They don't know about a, a scope and sequence. And yes, many, many people are investing more time in getting to know it. But the problem is a lot of people were very attached to things and letting go is so hard. But if we don't let go, kids are going to get hurt. But I still don't hear enough solution based, like what's next coming out. I have, I have, a, I have a little bit of a hypothesis I'll put forward. And, and maybe I'm a bit biased because I, I did put this forward in my book, basically. But yeah, um, I think sometimes we focus on there's a there's a term you see it really a lot in um, fitness science. They'll talk about majoring in the minors because, you know, people are really interested in this stuff. We'll get really into the weeds on the debates on things like should we use heart words or should we use sight right. words or should we um, I teach it through blending drills? Um, and I, I feel like that's majoring in the minors. It's getting focused and bogged down in these really minute details. And what we where we have the strongest evidence is on these really big picture things. You know, I think there's a lot of big picture evidence that we should teach phonics, that we right. should teach it in a systematic way, which the NRP defined as having a scope and sequence, including yeah. decodables and being explicit, um, teaching fluency instruction. I, you know, I was listening to your interview with Tim Rosinski, and I, I, I actually disagree with him on a lot of things. But one thing I do agree with him on is that fluency does not get enough attention. Yeah, me too, Nate. And, that yeah. was exactly how I felt through the yeah. whole show. Yes. And, you know, phonemic awareness is another one. Like, I think then this is one where I thought maybe the the balance literacy people weren't paying enough attention to. I think they have some phonics, but I don't I've never seen a lot of phonemic awareness drills being associated. Not enough. Not enough. Yeah. And. And, and one that some, is getting a lot more attention now that really wasn't getting attention. I didn't believe in it the first time I heard it too. I remember um, Dr. Catherine Garforth was telling me about it and Pete Bowers was telling me about it. It was morphology. And the first time yeah. they explained to me, I was like, what? I've never heard of this. How could it be important? Um, but I think they're right. I think morphology is important. Yes, and I agree. Me comprehension. too. Uh, these are the things that I think matter. And focusing on these big issues. And I actually, it's funny, like, we 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 talking about balance literacy, balance literacy, balance literacy. The problem with balance literacy, in my opinion, is it's not balanced. Mm -hmm. it's, it's putting way too much emphasis on the fluency and comprehension side, especially way too early. And way too early. All yeah. the word work. And That's what I was trying to say with um, Dr. Tim Rosinski that it was way too early to put such emphasis on those things. So I'm not crazy. <laughs> no. And yeah, Wait, can I jump in again? Yeah, but definitely. then why were teachers, literally, we had to have that FMP continuum. It was like 7,000 pages and it looked like it was a Bible. And we were told, this is what you need to do. This is, there was a wheel of knowledge in there. There was like, like, how do we make sense? Like, how did that all happen that we were told to do something that wasn't best well, for kids? I think, I think curriculum documents in general, they get too much put in them. And I think it's part because a large group of people come together to try and make a curriculum document and everybody wants their little pet thing in and it just becomes this enormous beast of a document. Mm -hmm. um, this summer, 
I put forward a, a like a, a curriculum with a group of um, people far more qualified than myself, and we tried to base it as solidly in evidence as we could, and only what we had the strongest evidence for. And we tried really hard to make it as small as possible because I think you know teachers are not going to read a seven thousand page curriculum document. That's right. That's and right. we made ours ten pages for the entire you know K to grade twelve. And yeah. the idea was like, what do we have the strongest evidence for? What do we know is important? And that's it. That's all we put in. And right. uh, it's just, right. I think it's focusing on these big pictures and making sure we're covering everything, but also doing it in a logic order. And, you know, I, Dr. Tim Shanahan put out an article about phonics first. And I'm not saying phonics first, but I am saying that in the earlier grades, we should be more focused on phonics, phonemic awareness, and morphology. And in the later grades, we should be more focused on fluency and comprehension. And that is not to say only do comprehension and fluency right. in later grades and only do phonics in the early. Er, you get what I'm saying. I'm talking. Yes. About, no, but. no. I, you, you know what? Um, I'm in agreement with everything that. I'm partially, partially, partially. Yeah. Well, I still I'm, think that even with phonics books, you yeah. can still do phrasing and fluency. You yeah, that's, still, but that's what I think he's saying. You could, but you I, could do I, it right I, from the beginning, Faith. You could yes, still, like, can, if a kid is reading a book with CVC words and now they're doing silent E, go back a couple of skills and let them gain their phrasing and fluency. Right, right but I think I what, what we're talking about yeah. here is having kids use words that, let's say, they didn't um, you know, get to in terms of their phonic scope and sequence. Right, right. That, and they're supposed to sound fluent using no. words that they haven't read before. No, that's very different. Read. Yeah, that's, that's very what different. I think. Yeah, made. that's very yeah, different. Yeah, I, 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 for the very early grades, I think, and I, I, I actually, I've come around on this. I was less pro decodables when I first looked at it because if you look at the individual studies on decodables, there's very little research on just decodables themselves. And the right. research itself is an impressive. But if we look at the National Reading Panel, they looked at this issue in a larger way where they looked at phonics programs that included decodables versus yes. phonics programs that did not. And they had other factors lumped in. This is where they had that systematic thing. But um, they showed better results for the phonics programs. And I think where decodables make sense is your fluency work at the beginning. Exactly. And it makes total sense to include that. But no, I, I agree with you. At, at teaching students fluency with words that they don't have the decoding skills right from the start, I don't, I don't love that. Neither do uh, I. Neither do I. So, okay. So let's wrap it up. So let's do, um, it. let's do it. So Nate, any last thoughts that you have that you, that we didn't ask you or you didn't get a chance to say, now's your time. Um, you know, I just, I would encourage people to, to take a nuanced perspective and, and to be kind to each other. I think sometimes in these, these debates that people get really heated and really upset and, um, I try my best not to get heated and not to, to, you know, criticize individuals, but to focus on ideas. And I think that's a better way of doing it. Don't, don't focus on the one study or try and tear it to pieces because you don't agree with it or one researcher because you don't agree with it. Try to find, I think it's good to find common ground, but I, I do think we need to be more critical also. We, and that goes for all sides. So, yeah. I, and um, I would agree with that. I think that I'm always looking at my practice and trying to reevaluate what I do. And, you know, I'm not going to say everything is perfect. I'm, I'm always looking at where the holes are and trying to figure out what's missing. And I think yes. that's the message I want to impart that we, we have to kind of look at, as you said, the big picture. Judy, any last thoughts? Absolutely. So first of all, I want to thank Nate for joining us. This is an honor and a privilege to even be able to speak to you. Seriously, it's pretty awesome. Like I always tell Faith, I'm like, where are these researchers or where are the people that look at studies? So it's amazing to have somebody that has more knowledge than I do at looking at studies. It's not really that easy for me. So I really appreciate being able to talk in a safe space where I felt comfortable enough, you know, expressing my thoughts. Um, another thing that I want to say is, you know, many of us for years and years, we loved running records. Move on. Acadians yeah. is an amazing, amazing universal screener. It's so effective. It gives you so much information quickly. Just sometimes embrace change and know that it's okay. Let go of the past. Doesn't mean you have to let go of everything. Just be open-minded. And I think the last thing 
no matter what program you're using or what method you're using, make sure that you think about, you know, I taught this to you in phonics. Now you have to transfer those skills into, you know, connected text and in text in general, because that's one of the biggest gaps that I see for many students is transferring the skills that they learned in isolation doesn't happen easily. So whatever program you're using, whatever you're doing, just make sure to try to make that happen. That's Nate, great advice. I, I want to thank you for coming on. And I'm going to chime in with Judy that it was a real pleasure speaking with you, especially because you do consider yourself a teacher first. And I think sometimes the um, researchers are a little bit removed from this and they, they aren't current with their teaching practices. And um, you're, you're doing the work, you're in the trenches, and to have someone speak to this at this level with us was really a pleasure. So thank you so much. And um, we'll be talking. Thank you. All right. Take All care. right. Thank Good you. Night. Thank you. All right. Bye.